Good morning, friends. We're going to start a new series that's going to take us through the summer called Formed. And I want you to finish this sentence for yourself. I am the product of my... You fill it in. I am the product of my generation, you might say. Like my generation has formed the way I think about the world, how I participate in the world. I am the product of my family. Like my family's crazy, and you know what? That's why I'm crazy. I am the product of my upbringing, the culture that I was raised in. I am the product of my friends. I'm the product of my anger. I'm the product of my grief. I'm the product of you fill in the blank for you. The reality of it is that you are the product of, meaning something, someone has formed you, has shaped you, has molded you in their image. And like most of us, that is, that is true that, that many people have done that. There is a Dutch priest by the name of Henry Nouwen who simply says, to be human is to learn to be human. Every human being learns what it means to be human from someone. We do not form, we do not define, we do not shape ourselves. And so God has first and foremost put us in families. And some of those families have moms and dads and they're great moms and dads and, and they've shaped us and formed us. Maybe some of us grew up in single parent families or no parents really around, raised by relatives. And that has been a formational experience for you early on of what it means to be human. You started taking on family identities. And then you started realizing other people had different identities. And maybe you gravitated towards them. And so you were formed and shaped by other people teaching you what it was to be human. Friends. Maybe it was coaches. Teachers. In fact, today we, we follow people. We follow influencers. We subscribe to podcasts. We want them to teach us their ways of being human, of seeing the world, and we adopt many of their practices in our life. To be human is to learn to be human from others. And we have learned this often to our benefit and often to our frustration. In our formation, there have been many things that are good, but there are also many things inside of us that we wish we could change. And we would change them if we felt like we had the power to do it. There's something in us that says there are things we want to do, we want to accomplish, we want to become, even in our character, but we just can't do it, it seems like. And there are things that we want to uproot from our life, habits and behaviors that we see are destructive to ourselves, even to others, that we wish we could stop. We've tried to stop. We seem to can't, we can't stop. The apostle Paul puts himself in this boat when he says, man, there are things that I don't want to do that I keep on doing. I can't stop it. There are things that I want to do, good that I want to do, but I don't do it. And he says, I, I am this wretched man. Because what a wretched person I am. What a wretched man I am. And then he asks this question, who will deliver me? I need to be freed, delivered, changed, transformed from this body of death. It feels like death, doesn't it? It is so frustrating when there's something you want to stop doing, but you can't. And there's something you want to start doing, but you won't. It feels like death. And then Paul says, but thanks be to God. That there's a way. And that way is through Jesus Christ our Lord. That if you want to experience the true formational change, to stop doing the things that you don't want to do and start doing the things that you really want to do and become who God has truly made you to be, you have to do it with Jesus. And so we begin this series with, with this premise. Everybody is formed by somebody. Everybody is formed by somebody. Somebody has taught you how to be you. Many people have taught you how to be you. And you've adopted many of these things. 
and we think about the external formation of us. We, we have an external form that we're projecting to the world, and we know how to change that. We know how to change our hair color, our hairstyle. Well, I don't know how to do those things, but you do. You can change your outfits. You can get the Viore. You can get whatever's latest, hottest, greatest. You can buy a new car, move to a new neighborhood. You can change the external form, and then you know you at the end of the day. And it's like, how do you change the internal form? The one that's really bothering me, shaping me, molding me. I want to be able to change it. And the reality is it's thanks be to God that Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, he is the invisible God made visible to show us what it means to be truly human. He has come and provided a way to set you free, to change your form. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. In writing Mere Christianity, Lewis says, In that sense that we need Christ, in that sense our real selves are always waiting for us in Him. If He's the image of God and we're made in the image of God and He's come to repair the image of God, being human, then we find our true selves when we find ourselves in Him. It is no good trying to be myself without Him. The more I resist Him and try to live on my own, the more I become dominated by my own heredity and upbringing and surroundings and natural desires. The more I resist Jesus Christ's transformational work in my life, the more I am dominated by all the voices and people in my story, good and bad. And I'm owned by it. It's like I'm enslaved by it, and I can't change and become the person that I want to be. In fact, this idea of becoming myself isn't really even myself. He goes, in fact, what I so proudly call myself becomes merely the meeting place for trains of events which I never started and which I cannot stop. What I call my wishes become merely the desires thrown up by my physical organism or pumped into me by other men's thoughts or even suggested to me by devils. And so this idea of finding myself, becoming myself, freeing myself apart from Jesus you just become more and more dominated by all the people that have formed you in their likeness. And that's a body of death that, that Paul says. And who can free us from this? Because when we talk about our identity, when we introduce ourselves at a dinner party, maybe it's a graduation event, a new work function, and we're introducing ourselves, we're always introducing ourselves in light of our stories. This is who I am. This is where I was born. This is where I was raised. This is what's happened to me, good, bad, and ugly. In fact, you know, I introduced myself as I'm Thomas. I was born and raised in Boulder, Colorado. Like, that's a thing. That shapes me. That's different than someone who was born in Dallas, Texas. That's born in Tennessee or Alaska or out of this country. I remember my aunts and uncles from the East Coast being like, oh, Thomas, you're from the land of fruits and nuts. And I'm like, what? I don't think we eat that much trail mix. I have no idea what you're talking about. And then later I came to find out, oh, that was like an insult. Interesting, from my own family. <laughs> but think about your own story. Apart from Jesus, the perfect man, the God man, fully God, fully man, who teaches us what it means to be human. Apart from him, we are only dominated by all those other voices. In fact, we can never truly find, quote-unquote, myself apart from him who is the author of us, the creator of us, the shaper of your personality, your heart, your desires. Who you are truly made to be is found in the work of Jesus Christ. Now, the great thing is Jesus Christ's work is not just a saving work from hell to forgive sins so that you can be saved from something. His work is that you would be saved to something. The scriptures talk about our salvation as having been saved and being saved. And that being saved is that we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul says, Romans chapter 8. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose... 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. It means that he predetermined something to happen. He predestined to be conformed, to be shaped, molded to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That God wants to bring you into the family of God to look like the family of God. And his good purposes, the purpose that he has set out is that we would be shaped and formed to look like Jesus. That the life and character and nature of Christ in his humanity could be ours. That we'd be transformed into his likeness. And God will use all the things in life to do it. It says, for those who love God, it's like, I love God. For those who love God, he will use everything. He won't let anything go to waste in your life. The good, the bad, the ugly, he'll use it all for good. Now, what's the good there? The good is to form you into Christ. So he'll use your life as the tailor-made curriculum for you to be shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. He's using the tailor-made curriculum in my life that's hard for me. That, I, that I'm desperate for him to do something with to shape me into his image. Now, here's, here's why the curriculum of other, other people's lives don't work, is it's not, not built for you. That's why you look at other people's lives and you're like, man, they have it so easy. It's so easy to be them. Have you ever thought that? It's so much easier to have their life. But you don't know how hard it is to have their life. Their curriculum is forming them into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so that curriculum's not built for them. Or sorry, not built for you. It's built for them. And so we don't need to be jealous of other people's curriculums. We don't need to look around and and, and gauge our life compared to others. We simply say, God, in my life, the good, the bad, the ugly, you'll use all of it. You won't let any of it go to waste. You'll use all of it to form me for your good purposes that you predetermined that those who come to Christ would be formed into his likeness. And this is what Paul is passionate about. This is what Paul is doing in congregations all around this area. Think about the, in the church to Galatia. He writes this, Galatians 4, chapter 19. He says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Like, what, what's Paul doing? Just starting churches, trying to build, like, organizations, money-making machines, influence power? No, no, no. The whole purpose of gathering as the people of God is this, that something new would be birthed in you. He says, I- I'm working, I am toiling, I'm in anguish like a mother trying to bring new life, a new identity, a new beginning in you. And that new beginning to its completion is the fullness of Christ. That's what Paul wants to have in the men and women of the congregations. That's what we want to have in your life. That's what I want in my life is the fullness of Christ in me. Now, is that a good thing? What would it look like to have the character nature of Christ in us? Like we're all subscribed to certain people. We're all following certain people. We know what it would be like to to try to imitate their life. What would it look like if we were pattering, 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 pattering? Pattering our life. That's not even a word, is it? <laughs> patterning. Patterning with an N. Thank you, Rob. That's why we hired Rob Bates, everybody. <laughs> I have fun on Sundays. I hope you do. What would it look like if we did that after Jesus? Well, what, what's the character nature? What's the spirit of Jesus look like? Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, before you say, like, that's what I want, let me just put this in your mind. You're that person that's really annoying in your life. Wouldn't you want that to become their nature and character? It's like, oh, yeah, my husband, my wife, my children, my boss, my neighbor, if they can become, lo- they can be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, that'd be really, really good for them. You know what they're thinking about you? <laughs> the same thing. It'd be really, really good if the spirit of Christ, the form of Christ, transformed us. 
Just think about that for a second. What would it look like in your life if all of a sudden the joy of Jesus that you see in his ministry became your joy? Imagine if, if the way in which Jesus loved other people became the way in which you were able to love other people. I mean, I mean like difficult people, challenging people. What would it look like for the patience of Christ? You saw how he was patient with Pharisees, with fundamentalists, with sinners and tax collectors, with his own disciples. What if that took up residence in your life and you began to experience that kind of patience? How about just kindness? of goodness, of that, that generosity that we saw through the life of Jesus Christ becomes the way in which you're generous to the world around you? Think about the ways in which Jesus exhibited self-control. What if you became as self-controlled as Jesus? You know what self-control would give you? It would give you the ability to say no to the things you actually want to stop doing and to do the things that you want to do. That's what a life under self-control is is being able to stop and to start the things that you want. You see, I'm hungry for the fullness of Christ to be formed in me. And I long for it to be formed in you as well. This is what is driving Paul. And he is working really, really hard, as hard as he can work, to make this a reality in the people of God. This is what he writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. He says, Him we proclaim, that's Jesus Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone who is mature, full, complete in Christ. He says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Yes, he is working, but he's working with Christ. See, see, Paul says, this is what I want. I want everyone to be presented mature in Christ. This is what I'm toiling for. This is what I'm waking up early for, going to bed late for. This is what I'm after. And I'm not doing it alone. But Paul most certainly is doing it. See, this is one of the lies we believe in our Christian faith sometimes. Is that we really can't do anything. And so why do anything? Like, it doesn't depend on me. Isn't it grace alone? Like, if, if you ask me to participate and work hard towards this, isn't that works? Isn't that merit? Not at all, friends. Now, it can get there. It can become bent to think that way. But in fact, God calls us to participate in this. Dallas Willard, who writes a lot on spiritual formation, who simply says, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. And so to do the things that Jesus is doing, to practice the things that Jesus is doing, to follow Jesus is going to take effort on your part. It's hard sometimes. But grace is not opposed to that. Now here at Calvary, I'm going to preach every single Sunday that we are saved by grace through faith. And that is not of yourself, but a free gift of Jesus Christ so that nobody can boast that they came to Christ. Absolutely amen. But we are called to strive, to toil, to put to death, to give effort into our formation. And effort in our formation isn't just up to us. This is why Paul is saying, I'm, I'm toiling, but I'm toiling with the energies that God provides. Which means our formation isn't solely dependent on us, though it does depend on our efforts and our engagement but it is in partnership with God. It is in partnership with God. And so here are the principles so far that we've learned. Okay, We are all being formed by someone or something. Our true form is found in Jesus. And God's transforming work happens in partnership with him. See, this is what, what Paul has been commissioned to do. This is what Jesus sent all the disciples out to do. After his resurrection, after he was teaching the disciples many things, before he ascended, he gathered them together and said, okay, listen, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth, like all authority everywhere has been given to me. Not some authority, but all authority has been given to me. Therefore, he's going to say, therefore, I commission you. 
in partnership with me. Like, we're going to be doing something together. I commission you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, like everywhere, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Like, we're going to do this together. And do you think it takes some effort to go make disciples of all nations? Probably. Absolutely. But this is our call with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit indwelling us. But the call remains. Go make disciples. What is a disciple? It's not just a spiritual world, a word. A disciple is a, here's some other words that you might use, a student, an apprentice, a mentee, a pupil, a follower. Now, everyone in this room probably is following someone, either live in person or digitally in some platform, followers. Jesus is saying, go make followers, disciples of me. Those who practice the things that I practice, that do the things that I did, that live the rhythms and habits that I have lived, that I have shown you how to live. In fact, that's rooted in the Great Commission here. Teaching them, it says, teaching them to observe. That means to practice, to obey, to follow all the things that I have commanded you. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, go make disciples, teaching them to know everything that I said. It says, go and make disciples who observe, practice, follow, obey all the things that I say. It's to do the things that Jesus calls us to that makes us a disciple. It's the practice of these things that makes us a true disciple. It's not knowing alone. And so here's one of the dangers about being at Calvary Bible Church, where we love our Bible, where we want you to know your Bible, is that you can become really informed without practice. And that's not going to help you. And so my desire of informing you about what Jesus has said is this is the end, so that you would be in formation of Jesus Christ's life. The reason I want to inform you about what Jesus taught is so that you would be in formation of his life. Does that make sense? We want to practice. We want to follow the things that Jesus taught us. That's what makes us a disciple. Now, there are a lot of disciples in the world. Disciples are, remember, students, apprentices, pupils, mentees that are practicing the ways of their teacher or the object of what they want to become. And when they look at what they want to become, it's broken down in certain disciplines. A discipline is a practice or a habit that you would do in your life to become something. And so if you wanted to become a great musician and you started following a great teacher they would lay out for you certain disciplines. They say, this is what you must do. You have to say no to this, say yes to this, practice this way that you might become this musician. If you want to be an athlete, there are disciplines within the practices to become a baseball player, to become a volleyball player, to become any sort of athlete. Now, here's where disciplines differ in the spiritual sense is it's not the discipline itself that shapes us into Jesus. The discipline itself is to provide the space necessary to connect us to the life of Jesus Christ, for Him to do the work that only He can do. The discipline is connecting ourselves to Jesus Christ so that we have space in our life that He can do what only He can do, transforming us from death to life. In John 15, Jesus says, you know, I'm the, I'm the vine. You can do almost nothing without me. No, he says, you can do nothing apart from me. And so our practices of faith are to connect us to the life-giving source of Jesus Christ that brings the true and lasting transformation. But that's what we're after if we're called to be his disciples. In fact, looking at his disciples, at the end of one of his teachings, Jesus simply says, this is Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? 
So looking at his disciples, he says, okay, you're calling me teacher, rabbi, master, Lord. But then you don't go do the things that I call you to do. So something is not right. Either A, I'm not actually your Lord, or you're not being a good student. Which is it? It's not simply Christianity to say, I I follow Jesus, I go to church on Sunday, and then I don't practice anything else of the ways of Jesus. Jesus is saying, hey, that, that that is not fitting. And so if you're going to call me Lord, then practice my teachings. Or don't call me Lord. But in order to incentivize them, say, well, why would I practice the teachings of Jesus? I mean, I love that the character and nature of Jesus would be in me. Love, joy, peace, patience, and all of that. I want that, yes, but I have real problems in life. He says, okay, well, here's the deal. If you practice my teachings, let me tell you what you're like. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my word and, you see what it says, does it. Like, puts it into action. Everyone who does that, I will show you what he or she is like. He is like a man building a house, and the house is representative of a life. It's building a life. Someone who wants to build a life. You want to build a life? I want to build a life. It's like someone who's building a life who dug deep and laid the foundations of their life on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. See, to do the things that Jesus did, to put into practice the teachings of Jesus is so that you would have a well-built life that endures the storms that come. There's storms coming for everybody. There's financial storms. There's health storms. There's relational storms. They're all coming. How do you build a life that weathers the storms? Because he's going to go on to say a foolish builder is one who doesn't put my words into practice. Maybe they even know God's word, but they they go build their life on something else. They follow truly someone else's teaching, and they build their life on sand, and when the storms come, man, that person's life is washed away, and great is its ruin. And so a well-built life that endures the storms of life, that endures the hardships, the griefs, and the sorrows, is built not knowing, but doing, practicing, obeying, following the disciplines and practices of Jesus. And so as we practice these things, what we're really doing is we're getting our eyes on Jesus. The only reason we practice any of this is so that we can look at Jesus. And this is where the mystery happens, is somehow getting around the life of Christ and doing the things that Jesus did changes us from one degree of glory to another. And it happens so that it would be permanent. Now, we looked at this last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, okay, look at the old covenant that was a covenant that was fading and going away. It wasn't built to last. And Moses in that covenant would meet with God, and for a moment he would be transformed. He would would look different. There'd be like this glory on his face. And then when he would come down the mountain and he would leave the presence of God, that glory, that transformation would fade and disappear. And so he would actually put down a veil so that the Israelites wouldn't see the fading glory of him being with God. And Paul says, we have a greater covenant, a permanent covenant, that transforms us permanently as we behold Jesus. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, sorry, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. This is the real freedom, to become who God has made you to be. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the work that only God can do. And so our habits and our practices are ways in which we behold the glory of God. And it seems like, why am I doing this? I don't feel any different I don't sense anything happening, but over time, God's doing a work that only God can do to transform you 
from one degree to another into the fullness of Christ. That is our desire. Now, last, it's this. Transformation begins in us, but it's not ultimately for us. It's for one another. When Jesus talks about the transformed life, it, it's the transformation that produces fruit. He'll often use the analogy of a tree bearing fruit. Is the fruit of the tree for the tree? Not primarily. What's the, what's the fruit for? Is to be given away to others. That they would be nourished by the fruit of the tree. And so this transformation that, yeah, I, I desire to experience my own life. I want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in my life. But imagine the fruit that that produces that you might enjoy. Imagine the fruit that your life can produce that I would enjoy, that I would be nourished off of. Imagine if Christ could fully imprint his image in all of his children where, all, where they all live. And like little Christ, little image bearers are scattered throughout the front range because the fullness of Christ is in them and they're bearing Christ's fruit that nourishes the community of people. That is, the world looks and says, what's God like? They say, I don't know, there's a, there's a fruit-bearing tree of a fully formed Christ producing the life of Christ through them. Let's go eat there. Let's go be nourished there. Perhaps the transformation that has happened in their life could happen in my life. And so this is what we're after this summer, is to look at the formation of Jesus, that we cannot become like Jesus if we're not doing the things that Jesus showed us to do. So here are the four things again. We are all being formed by someone. Everybody's in a formation process. Our true form, if you really want to become who God has made you to be, is found in Jesus. If we recognize that that discipline, these practices, is a partnership with Him, that He does a mysterious work that we can't do. But we give our effort to it. We will learn that his transforming power begins in us and it's to be given away for others. It's going to be a beautiful thing this summer. I hope you'll hang around. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this community of believers who gather to worship, to open your word, to peer into the life of Christ that we might be changed. And so, Heavenly Father, we just want to surrender to you now our summer. We want to surrender to you this next series and ask that you would do a work in us that we could not do in of ourselves. Lord, we ask that you would woo us, that you would be so captivating that we would want to give our best efforts to this. And Father, may we in humility trust in your grace, that we would trust ourselves to you, trust ourselves to the process, trust ourselves to the timing of fruit production that belongs to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would bring what we long, which is freedom and change that lasts. In your name we pray, amen.